Hello and welcome to the MG EVs podcast streaming live today, Monday the 20th of February 2022. We're here to talk about all the MG vehicles, uh, hoping to inform and entertain you for about an hour or so. I'm Dave Stewart, Dave S on the forum, and joining us uh, tonight uh, is Steve Green. Hi, Steve. Good evening, how are you? And Steve's got a forum name? Uh, Steve is Green or before still think it's clever steve love it and uh a new contributor to the podcast but certainly not uh, uh, to the community uh from thailand paul white hello paul hello yes i'm paul in thailand on the forum it does what it says in the turn eh? and from the charlie group in lancashire england miles roberts hello miles hi everyone uh i've changed my username i'm now miles roberts cg on the forum Oh, right. Okay. Just, to, just to make it clearer that I am working for Charlie Group and it's not, yeah, because I was miles per kilowatt hour before, which I thought was funny, but it didn't help people search for that easily. So. Okay. Uh, it, and it is funny. So thanks, everybody. If you're watching us live, thank you for joining us. And please kick, click the like button and join in the discussions in the chat window. I see a few folk have started off already. So thank you. We'll be picking up on these points as we go through. In the main, tonight's podcast, we'll be chatting about the late deliveries of the new long-range ZS EV to the UK. Uh, Miles has got one or two snippets of uh, MG News, including a little teaser about a new version coming. And we'll be looking at the increase in energy prices and, and how that's affecting us. So, Paul, welcome aboard. Do you mind spending just a couple of minutes telling us a wee bit about yourself, your car, and what it's like driving a, an EV in Thailand, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so a little bit about the background. You might be asking why I'm in Thailand. I, I actually worked in Thailand a few years ago. Then I, I then moved to Hong Kong and decided that work didn't agree with me. So I decided I would retire. So 10 years ago, I retired and came back to Thailand to do scuba diving. I'm a scuba instructor and play tennis. Um, that wasn't really fulfilling enough, so I ended up moving to northeast Thailand to build an off-grid eco house with solar and EV. Um, it turned out that the EV was the hardest bit. Um, I put a deposit down on a ZS EV a, a couple of years ago, basically when they were first announced in uh, in Thailand, and uh, unfortunately, I was basically told that uh, I wasn't able to, to, to have the EV because um, in Thailand they give you a complimentary wall box, uh, an MG wall box and uh, the install company basically said that I couldn't have it if I wanted to have solar, I had to have a second grid connection, a dedicated grid connection into the, into the wall charger so I ended up losing my deposit on that car um, and when the, uh, the HS PHEV came out I thought, hmm, smaller battery, smaller onboard charger, can't be a problem, um, and basically had the same sort of situation. So I ended up reaching out to the president of, of MG Thailand and, and asked for his help, and uh, he put one of his guys on to the situation, and, uh, and now I have a, a plug-in hybrid, which I'm charging from my solar system. Um, I absolutely love it. In, driving in Thailand. I see on the forums people talking about wanting to drive in EV mode and that and you know wanting to have the heater on at the same time. So that's not a problem for me. Uh, you can have the air con and uh, and uh, EV mode. So so I'm all right. Is that enough? Paul, when you said you lost your deposit, are you aware that everybody listening in Scotland just went, oh my God. <laughs> He's lost well, what I could have done is I, you know, in I could have had a grid connection and then paid for power. Yeah, I, I, to me, it would made more sense really to stick to my guns and say I want solar. Great. So they did not let you have the car without getting the charger. Would they not let you I, arrange your own charger separately? I, I, I tried that route and I was told it would invalidate my car warranty. warranty. Well, well, that's their argument. I'm just thinking, well, Thailand's the only country in the world that does that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good, so good. Not using the other charges in Thailand then either. I, I think what M MG thought that it was 
so difficult for people to get a wall charger because there isn't, you know, there isn't a market for them really. EVs right. are very new here. So it's just the easiest way to get people into EVs is here's your car, here's your wall box, and we'll come and fit it for you. They outsource the install. And it was the outsourced install company were causing all the problems. They were just like, don't understand solar, solar's no good, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, well, um, feel free to chip in with, uh, it's great when we have uh, various countries coming on board as well with New Zealand, Australia, uh, obviously we have Norway quite quite often as well, so it just adds a, a, a wider perspective and, and thank you for that. And talking about wider perspectives, everybody, before we start, we really need to acknowledge the situation in the Ukraine and our thoughts and sympathies go out to all those who are affected. It may seem almost glib to be spending time discussing issues about our MGs and our electric cars when people who up to a couple of weeks ago were living lifestyles pretty similar to our own, who have had these taken away so unfairly and the horrendous threats their lives on their lives hanging over them as, as we speak. I saw a clip of a, a, on the news of a Ukrainian woman who said just a few weeks ago, her main issues were the weekly shopping and home improvements. Now it's her very existence and that of her family. We can only hope that sanity prevails as soon as possible and the disgusting threat is quickly removed and the good people in Ukraine and indeed the good people in Russia can get back to their normal lives. I've noticed some members uh, in, uh, with avatars, including blue and yellow, uh, reflecting the U Ukrainian flag. And our thoughts go out to you and, and yours to anyone who's affected. Moving on, a quick note, I, I, I'm, I'm hosting tonight, a quick note to our, our good pal Stuart Whitman, who's now retired from the podcast. Uh, he is 94 years of age after all. Um, uh, he sold his MG5 to buy an alternative car because that was more suitable to his uh, becoming a driving instructor. I'm sure everybody wishes Stuart good luck and I, I hope uh, all prosperity in his new venture. Uh, our last video uh, was the interview. It was the interview format with Miles chatting to Charlie Cook from Right Charge, which seemed to spark a good lot of interest on, on, on the on the forum. Thanks for all the comments to to the thread, Miles. For those who possibly didn't catch the the, the podcast, can you give us a quick summary of what you and Charlie were talking about, please? Yeah, of course. So basically, I mean, please do watch the video. It's very informative. Um, it sort of goes through all those typical questions that people who are new to EV may have about getting a home charger installed, um, about things like the grid connection, the uh, is there enough supply to the house, what sort of charger you should you should go for, whether you should go for a three kilowatt or seven kilowatt, single phase, three phase, um, type one, type two, uh, whether you should get one that's a smart charger, should you go for a zappy if you've got solar, those sorts of things. So. Um, right Charge is a company which basically uh, it offers a comparison service for home chargers. So you, you go on there and you say, I've got a MG ZSCV long range um, and I have a driveway and uh, I usually charge at night and it'll come back and suggest ones which have got a type two connection that are either tethered or untethered that have a uh, smart functionality. So you're able to set timers on the charger so you can charge off peak and perhaps benefit from cheaper electricity costs. Um, and uh, they then list all of the charges sort of ranked by your by what would be most suitable for you, but also by price. So you can choose to go for the one that ticks all the boxes, but it's perhaps a bit more expensive, or you can choose to drop a couple of features and get one cheaper. And then it puts you in touch with a, a local installer and everything's arranged through the website and it's usually installed within about two weeks. So uh, we came and we talked about the ending of the government grant in the UK for the £350 that you get for installing home chargers uh, is ending at the end of March. Um, I believe there are still a few slots left actually so if anyone is yet to order a home charger and hasn't yet done so, if you go to the Right Charge website it'll reflect the price at the moment without the grant but then it may be able to actually retrospectively add the grant on top so that you save some money. So um, if you want to take a look at that, the links are on our website, on the forum, um, and on the video itself. 
Um, and I think for me, it was interesting. I, I've, I've been through the process of installing chargers three times now at different properties um, as I've moved up the ladder. I've been in EVs now for nine years. So I've you know, had that sort of length of service with EVs. Um, and uh, I found it very, very useful and uh, to get as a refresher for myself as much as anything else. But I think that certainly for those who are new to it and um, Paul, hopefully, you know, this is the sort of service that if you had in Thailand, it would take away a lot of those uh, concerns about, you know, getting solar fitted together with a, a home charge because you can literally tick that box and it then supplies the correct one for you. So I think that is uh, a useful a useful option. All it is on the UK and Ireland based at the moment. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, the, uh, the Marvel R has uh, 11 kilowatt three phase uh, onboard charger. Yes. Um, so if you were charging it at home, is it possible to get a wall box that would support that? It is, yeah. So in the UK, um, it's typically a European thing that they have three phase electric at the property more commonly than in the UK. Most UK properties have single phase electrics. Um, so the facelift ZS EV, for example, in Norway has the 11 kilowatt charger like the Marvel R. In the UK, it has a seven kilowatt single phase charger because single phase is more uh, prevalent in the UK. And if we had an 11 kilowatt system, it would basically just charge at three. So you just charge on a single phase uh, across the, the, the um, well, 3.6 uh, on the phases. So, um, so yeah, in the UK, we just uh, we have single phase electrics. So you can get uh, three phase to your property. Typically, you have to pay an upgrade fee and it's in the realms. I think I got a quote for a customer fairly recently, a new grid connection for that was going to, and it was fairly close to, you know, didn't have much driveway to dig up or anything out. It's about two and a half, three grand to get the um, three phase connection. Um, so it's, it's not inconsiderate amount of money um, compared to, you know, costing you a thousand pounds for a normal charger, which you then have to pay on top of as, as well as, um, and there's very few cars at the moment in the UK that benefits significantly from a three phase charging, you know, on your domestic property. Um, there are some new cars coming, which will have three phase, um, whether MG, you know, from other brands, Kia EV6, for example, Hyundai Ionic 5, uh, Tesla Model 3, uh, Nissan's Aria has got 22 kilowatts on board charger, um, a standard. So there are other cars coming forward, which have that, you know, sort of three phase charging capability. But in the UK, seven kilowatts is kind of more common um, and typically a cheaper install as well. Um, I've yeah, so I'm having problems see. with my with my charger at the moment. I, <clears throat> I also own a Hyundai a Kona. Yes. They don't, the, these two cars don't work with my charger the same way. The Kona won't charge sometimes. I have a friend who's got a Mokka. He's been charging in my house because he doesn't have a driveway. Mm -hmm. And that's, I've set that to charge overnight on the cheap rate. And that will charge overnight, but I have batteries and solar. And what it's doing at 4.30, it stops charging from the grid and starts sucking from my batteries. But my, oh. these two cars don't. It's very strange. Is that a charger you have? Yes, it's just. Yeah, I can just sort of see it behind your head, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I presume you've been on to Zappy to try and resolve I'm it, but it's trying to get all the details because I know what's going to happen. I'll go to my energy. They'll say it's the car, and you'll contact. Yeah, so you need the examples. You need to get like a, a log of what's happening when, and then they can look into the files and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's strange. I had a um, Mercedes that, in a, well, a Tesla Model Three wouldn't charge on my charger until I got a software update to the charger, so it just wouldn't charge. Don't know why. Everything else charged. Tesla Model 3 wouldn't. So I don't know, with that. and mine's not a Zappi, mine's a Anderson A2. Um, but yeah, for some reason, it, and you'd think that type two would be type two, would be type two, and it would all work. But some somewhere they're communicating, you know, one's talking Chinese and one's talking Mandarin or whatever. It's just a slightly different version. And it's, you know, not uh, not quite compatible. Yeah, one speaking different. Geordi and one speaking Welsh, you know, it's. Yeah, I'll try a different way, or different ways of doing it. Uh, is it doing it under these conditions, that condition, before I go off and start 
we're not complaining, but trying to get it sold. If we get all the information first, then at least I can say, no, it's not doing that, it does this. Mm -hmm. I'd say get examples, I think, and just go back to... Uh, Frustrating. Go back to my energy with it, yeah. Um, I understand the frustration, but it, it's, it's hard, like I say, when it's... But it works perfectly on two cars and not on the other. You yeah. kind of suspect it might be the car, but then Vauxhall will say... Really annoying gig up at 4.30 to turn off the zapping. Yeah, no, I imagine now. I speak about 4.30, so I think we should uh, uh, give uh, a wee bit of kudos, because in Thailand right now, it's 2.30, uh, 2.45 in the morning, Paul? In, yes, that's right, and I've not been to bed yet, in case <laughs> I, I overslept and missed the meeting. I hate meeting, missing meetings. Well, we truly appreciate that. In, in Yorkshire, it's 1987. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, uh, dear. Got it in before he did. So. <laughs> okay, the, the running order for tonight, as I say, we're going to cover, uh, get some update from you, Mel, is hopefully on the long-range ZSEVs coming into the UK. There's uh, a few folk in the, 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 the chat asking what's the latest update. So, Mel... Yeah, I've just been looking through some of the comments on that, actually, yeah. Um, yeah. Shall I jump into that now? Um, so, so basically, um, MG had this uh, plan that the would they would show the MG ZSEV long range in October, November. Um, that the first demonstrations would arrive in November, um, which they did, and that uh, the first customer cars would start to arrive end of December, start of January. And then they would launch the standard range 51 kilowatt hour version in January, and those cars would start coming from sort of March. Um, and what's happened is that uh, SAIC, who've been pretty damn good with um, avoiding uh, semiconductor delay issues up until recently, um, have had semiconductor issues with uh, particularly the some chips that go into the Trophy Connect version of the long range ZS. Um, and of course, most of the cars which were initially sold from people to placed orders, everyone said, I want to go for the top spec because that's kind of what everyone was, they were used to the exclusive spec when they had the ZS. So if they've upgraded and they've gone for the Trophy Connect, for an extra 500 pounds, why wouldn't you? Well, unfortunately, the why wouldn't you is that that's why it's been delayed. Um, it's got some additional chips which have uh, not been forthcoming. The factory has continued building the cars and they've put them, stacked them at the dock and, you know, readied them for basically they just need this head unit fitting effectively. Um, but, um, but yeah, and this has been an issue for a lot of manufacturers. So uh, Volkswagen, for example, have started shipping only one version of the ID3. Um, now you, you can only order one version of the ID3 because they, they don't have the, the parts available to make the various other different specs uh, available. Um, in fact, if you order a it's VW Polo um, at the moment, you can uh, if you want delivery, you have to have it without a stereo at all um, because the chip they can't get is the, D, the one that does the DAB radio. Oh. And um, there's a law that says that any car sold with a stereo in the UK has to have a DAB ability to receive DAB radio. It stems back from when we, the plan was originally we were going to turn off FM and we were just going to switch to DAB, which was supposed to happen about five years ago. They decided to leave FM going, but never cancel the law. So um, so we still have this hangover. So you've got to have DAB. If it's got radio, it's got to have DAB capability. Um, so the way that, um, that Volks, uh, Volkswagen have got around this is they've decided to delete the radio completely and just give you a blanking plate. Um, on some bottles of polo, which uh, takes it back to the 1987 Yugo 45A that I had, which didn't come with a stereo standard. Um, I did not buy that a new day before we start saying about me being. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think that uh, there's been massive problems around the industry for these chips. Um, one of the major semiconductor factories in Japan was wiped out by um, a, uh, a big natural seismic event. And then um, it takes a long time to set up replacement uh, production facilities for these things because they're very technical and very, 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 very microscopic, fine uh, manufacturing process. 
So it's not the sort of thing you can just, you know, chuck in a warehouse in a few days. It's, you know, needs some serious engineering behind it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so MG has succumbed to the uh, semiconductor issue. Now, the issue, of course, is that the cars do take a couple of months to come across mm -hmm. the water. Uh, and so once the vehicles have had the chips fitted, they then um, got to get them transported. And there's massive um, competition at the moment for um, shipping uh, from cars from China to the UK, particularly against companies like Tesla, who have factories out in China supplying the European market. Um, and so what's happened is there's been a bit of a race to the top in terms of pricing for available slots on boats. So it was costing about 200 dollars uh per car to ship a car from china to, to uk um back in 2019 um through the pandemic that rose to 1200 dollars per car so a six-fold increase um and recently it's gone up to sort of two to two and a half thousand dollars per car uh which is uh, and this is basically just because big companies like for example tesla are able to say well you know we've got a 45 fifty thousand dollar car here we can afford to absorb a grand of cost and get the car delivered quicker. And so they're outbidding uh, SAIC and another number, number of other companies on available shipping slots. SAIC has since uh, ordered um, and bought two uh, transporter ships for itself. Um, so I don't know if they bought them from Hyundai, that would be ironic. Um, but they've um, bought two shipping containers, sh two big ships, which will be capable of carrying several thousand vehicles each. So that should resolve the issue, but they're not due to come online for a month or two. So we're still going to see a bit of a hangover at the moment on deliveries. Um, and there's sort of two pronged attack of, of saying, you know, semiconductor shortages. And then when we've built the cars and they're finally done, um, actually physically get them on a boat and get them to UK. So um, they are resolving the issues, but it has unfortunately sort of Hit them at a bad time um and all of our deliveries have, have suffered as a result they have tried to supply other ships uh, so other cars in the meantime uh, to sort of you know fill room on ships if there was room to go um so we are now seeing some mg5 long range uh, deliveries coming through this month and uh we're seeing some mg zs standard range uh trophies and se models have been delivered and there may be a handful of, of long range that have been able to be fitted onto boats as well that have got the chips in time. This problem uh, isn't just uh, to, to, for UK cars, it's Europe as well. Yeah, and that's an also, also a consequence is that at the same time as MG, because MG UK launched the car before Europe, before the demonstrators, and the, the demonstrators were sent to Europe and to, to last year they sold 30,000 cars, uh, up from about 20,000 in. 2020 and up from about 12,000 or 15,000 in 2019. So the, the sales really, you know, really have taken an uptick. But the problem we've got is that um, they've also launched in Europe. And um, so Europe is taking a lot of cars as well, which then means that they also need semiconductors and they also need transport split spots. Um, and when you're trying to launch in UK, Norway, Netherlands, Germany, France, Spain, etc. That's an awful lot of cars that are coming across on the water, um, and so they've got to sort of in some you know in some cases if they've got a finite amount of chips or a finite amount of um, space on the ship, they've got to sort of take a decision as to well you know do we give twenty percent of the space to UK, twenty percent to Spain, to Norway, to you know so everyone gets a fair slice, or do they give it to you know, because they've got to try and support all of these markets at once. So we are seeing some cars coming across, but it is a lot, a lot longer than we would have hoped it would be. So I'm hearing cars that were purchased and hopefully delivered in March are now looking at June, July. Is that correct? On the ZS long range, particularly, <laughs> yes. Um, MG5, I say, I think we've got some coming through sooner. Um, if you're hanging on for a, for an MG5. Uh, if you've got a long delay and your current and your dealer, your current dealer doesn't have any, um, feel free to give us a shout. We've got um, I think we've got about twenty spare um, at the moment. So if you want to give us a shout for this month, for, for March, so um, yeah, give us a shout. But they are going quickly because we're 
we've, we've allocated stocks come across. We've obviously allocated to customers that had existing orders with us already. But then there's some people who've dropped off. They've gone to a different brand or different. They decided to go for the ZSEV long range instead or whatever. So we've got some spare orders that we didn't cancel. It's just annoying that the adverts on television so much that everybody's going, "Oh, when you get in your car, when you get in your car," and then. Yeah, well, the, um, the adverts on TV, obviously, those slots were um, agreed to um, months and months in advance. Mm -hmm. And so we're still paying for them. Um, so we might as well run the advert, but it's, uh, say, so we, MG, you know, we're still paying for it and running it. But um, and they'd still have to pay even if they didn't run the advert at the moment. So they might as well run the advert and try and get some brand awareness out there at least. But yeah. Paul, well, I might be putting my foot in it here, but. MGs are made in Thailand, aren't there? There are some. There, there are some in Thailand. Uh, yeah, that's one of the things I didn't get to talk about was the the import duties. I don't know if I can say something about that. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, if a car is made in Thailand, there is uh, there's, there's no tax on it. There's no um, import tax, and there's no excise duty. Uh, but if the car was made in the UK, it would be 80% uh, import tax and 8% um, excise. Um, you know, so that's quite a big difference. So manufacturers are setting up factories in Thailand and MG is one of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my PHEV is actually different spec. And I think they just tried a few things like we have, you know, we've got the, uh, you know, the iSmart you know, which is great because I can be in the shopping centre and turn the aircon on in my car, you know, and it'll be nice and cool by the time I get out there. So, you know, people have been saying to me on the forums, you know, oh, how do I get that in my British car? I'm going, well, it's got a, it's got a, you know, a SIM card embedded in the car. I don't know how you would just do a software update to do that. So I think it's just a, a different car, really. Mm -hmm. I, I see somebody was asking that in the chat, just how uh, flexible updates are via the app for the UK versions, Miles? Yeah, I just saw that. So someone's asking, um, uh, Dalek is asking about MG5 particularly. Um, is there an option of adding app remote to the current MG5 long range via software update? No. Uh, as as you were saying, it, it includes the SIM card and telecommunications ECU and things like that, which are just not available on the UK model at the moment. The facelift version will have the iSmart app and that should be coming available end of this year in the UK. Um, Dalek's also asked, uh, will the current MG5 long range 21 plate be granted safety towing access? No, uh, but the facelift model will be um, at the end of 2022. Where can I get roof bars for the current long range MG5? Um, totally it's got really. fairly um, universal roof rails, so you can get a, you can get anything from like 30 quid at Lidl upwards. Um, the 30 pound little ones I had on my MG5 uh, were very, very loud and whistly. Um, so I ended up getting some uh, Yakima Wisp bars, um, which are this, I don't think it lists, it's on roofbox.co.uk um, is where I got them from. They're about 200 quid a pair, but they are silent. You can literally put them on the roof, can leave them on all the time. No, don't notice any difference whatsoever in noise or efficiency or anything like that. How are the um, MG brand ones? Uh, MG were just selling rebrands of another, I can't remember who it was, who were you using? It wasn't, they weren't MG own manufactured ones. They were rebrand ones. And MG have stopped selling roof bars now through um, uh, through the main accessories. You can, they're only recommending third party. So Thule or Yakima or whatever. And I said on the forum to Dalek just now, eBay is selling them. Uh, someone else has said that Amazon's selling them. So yeah, you can get very easy those ones. So if, you, if it's going to be a one-off sort of occasional thing, then 30 quid set from Lidl or Amazon or eBay or whatever. Uh, universal, you know, 120 centimeter roof bars will fit fine and, and work for a load. If you're going to be, you know, taking a bike every weekend or a roof box every weekend or whatever away, a bit more money. probably want to get, yeah, you know, invest in some decent ones. Um, it was the odd trick down a, down a, down a, down a dump with something. It's yeah, just the cheapies are fine, aren't they? Yeah, it's if you're going to be doing like long touring holidays and things where the effects on the noise, I found with the cheap ones, as soon as you get above 40 miles an hour, um, they just sound horrific. It sounds like you've got one of the back windows open, you know, that sort of noise. So uh, yeah, I'd recommend that if you're going to go, you're using them for touring holidays and things for the sake oh. of 
arguments with your wife and things. Just, you know, get some ones that are quiet. I've got roof bars for the home guy, but unfortunately they don't fit on the ZX. Really oh, because the um, Hyundai's got the lock, the closed roof rails, hasn't it? Yeah. Rather than the open ones, they yeah. They grip onto what, barely anything there, but they grip onto that. Mm. So yeah, they don't fit on the bar, unfortunately. And Paul, I was looking at some of the things you posted. Is that a courtesy downlight, the MG courtesy downlight, is that standard or did you get up to some jiggery-pokery with that? Uh, no jiggery-pokery on, pokery on my part, sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's standard. It's uh, you, you, you switch the car on and this laser MG logo appears. Um, I don't know if um, somebody could show it, but uh, I put it in the, in the, the notes it's for the meeting. It's probably, yeah, it's probably from... Uh... I think I've seen a similar device for sale on AliExpress, so chances are it's it's like a a bit that some, one of the manufacturers made that, you know, it would add like three pounds to our cost or something, so that's why they don't do it in the UK, because by the time you've done VAT and everything on top and import duty, it becomes well, about £400. Pounds. Do, do it for, for lots of brands, I've seen them before. Yes, I, I had that Masia Tatica that had read that as you switched on the car but uh, oh i like the mg that's pretty good I like that yeah i've just seen sorry so um Sarpreev singh has just um put something in the comments provide an update on zs long range deliveries can we at least get trophy models ordered from last year during march april um speak to your dealer um it depends what stock and uh, as well the problem it, the difficulty is is that and i've said this before is that um MG don't build according to the order number. So in the UK, let's say we have 10 orders and the first three are for red Trophy Connects. The next two are black Trophy Connects. Then there's a blue Trophy and then there's a red SE and then there's a couple of uh, white Trophy Connects. MG will build in batch. So they might, they might go, okay, we're just gonna build um, blue trophies. We've only got one order for that out of those 10, but that's the one that's going to come first. And then they might not have any chips to make the Trophy Connects model, so then they're going to do the other trophies, which are the white ones or whatever. And then, so all these people who've ordered before you are still waiting for their car, and you can just walk in and go, you know, I'm going to have this one because I'm not fussed on spec and not fussed on colour. Um, the other problem we've got, though, is that Normally, we'd have some flexibility. We'd, we'd call our customers and say, look, you know, we've, I know you ordered a black trophy connect, but we've got a black trophy coming in. Would you fancy swapping? Um, uh, but we can't do that because of the grant change that happened 15th of December. So if you place your order before the 15th of December and you've got a two and a half thousand pound government plug-in car grant, that's locked on the actual model of car. Mm. So we're able to switch color, but we're not able to switch model. Okay. So if you got it on a trophy connect, Two and a half grand. We can't then transfer that two and a half grand onto a trophy. And also, both the trophy and trophy connect long range now in the UK don't qualify for the grant. So you potentially be losing out by the full two and a half thousand pounds. So it's not even like you just drop a thousand to go, you know, to go from a trophy connect to a trophy or vice versa. It's that you'd actually lose the full two and a half. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. So it, we're trying our best to sort of sort stock out, but it's. It's not great. And I say we often don't get, well, we don't as dealers get any notification about what's actually on the water. Um, somebody's asked what the ship names that the cars are coming on. We don't get that information. Mm. So we don't know what the cars, MG head office presumably will do. They'll know what cars are coming, but they've told me that they don't know until about a month before the cars arrive on UK soil. So again, we've got very limited really visibility of what cars are coming on when. Um, yeah, the, but, uh, last, question. So last question before we move on. I'm just saying, make both face gets a thumbs up from everybody else. Pretty yeah, much. Em's just put, with all the delays delivery of new cars, what state of charge does the manufacturer store the cars in? Um, the, all the cars have been coming to us with about 40 to 50% state of charge, which is kind of where you want it to be for a lithium ion battery. So um, yeah, they, they, they don't overcharge and they're not sat on 100%, they're not sat low. They've got about 30 40% in when they come off the transporter. Um, so yeah, obviously, MG wants to avoid any um 
any issues with battery longevity themselves because they're the ones warranty, war warrantying them. Mm -hmm. the warranty doesn't start until you've registered the car. So obviously they don't want to wreck the batteries before they get um, delivered. So hopefully that sets M's uh, mind at rest. Yeah. Oh, well, we've, we've just got to be patient. So, sadly, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so moving on now that you miles has got some breaking news and and uh, hopefully uh stuart has got a wee bit of uh, our own jiggery pokery set up there is a new car coming miles uh, there is indeed um roll vt if we can say that <laughs> or not there we go So this is a teaser from MG for what their co uh, code name is, the EH32. Volkswagen ID3, um, Cooper Elborn, etc. Um, it's uh, a brand new fully EV um, drivetrain, ground up EV. So it's you know, it's, just, it's not just a, it's not a conversion of some other petrol car, which is what the ZS and, and the HS and the. Um, so. Expecting uh, a couple of different battery options. Uh, so we're expecting that range, like they do with the standard range um, and long range ZS, where you've got a 50 and a 73. Um, some similar size batteries, but they might even bring a 60 out as well. Um, and um, not sure if it's going to Yes, it's still running. Okay, we stop the video. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, so just to say, sorry. So it's a, a, the MG4. It's the same sort of size as an ID3. Um, similar size to a Citroen EC4, that sort of size. Four point three meters. Um, hopefully, they can now hear me. See, Adam saying, "Can't hear you." Can you still? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Thumbs up. Yep. Um, so good. Uh, so uh, yeah. So the MG4. Um, it's going to sit between the MG3 and the MG5 in terms of size. Um, and uh, we've got um, yeah, potentially a couple of different battery sizes. Um, the expectation is that the range with a larger 73 kilowatt hour battery. Um, would give more range than the ZS. Um, so we're looking at potentially 300 miles or more um, from the top level car. Um, and um, the uh, motor itself, uh, so it's a complete ground up new platform. So it's, uh, uh, it's a completely new platform, not converted from petrol like the MG5 or the ZS EV. Um, and it's going to give you, um, means they can do like a skateboard chassis like you do with Tesla um, and that they can uh, choose where they put the motor. So I believe that they're looking at the moment uh, in potentially making it rear wheel drive like an AD3. Uh, so that should be interesting. Um, and there's talk of performance versions in the future also. Um, one of the things that... Um, I know that uh, Guy Piganyakis we did an interview before Christmas on here with, with Guy from MG. Um, he used to work for MG back in when they launched the MGF. And uh, he's quite, and when they had the X Power brand um, and they were doing the, you know, touring cars and all that sort of thing. So um, he's got a lot of history with sporty models of, of MG himself. 
and he's quite keen that to see that they um, aren't become known again. You know, in the UK where they were always known as doing sort of sporty versions of Rovers and things like that, uh, that they've become known again as doing uh, performance vehicles. So we're expect, you know, we're hoping to see this unveiled properly uh, around April, um, which would give you um, hopefully then car deliveries starting by the end of the year, if they can get enough semiconductors made in the meantime to be able to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's all we, we know really at the moment is just what we've seen on Auto Express um, and Auto Car and various other car websites. But the car is undergoing testing in Europe at the moment. Um, they haven't got a pre production model in the UK yet. Um, they've got a pre 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 production um, methods built car, which is basically held together with gaffer tape and tin foil. Um, so it's not uh, for the cameras yet, but. Uh, they are work, you know, there will be a car unveiled very, very soon to the public, and it should be in MG dealers by the end of this year. Good. And any other hot bits of gossip you can share with us? Um, um well, it's been there's been uh, various talks on, on again, on Auto Express and Auto Car and so on about uh, the Cyberster uh, sports car. Um, that project is ongoing. Um, MG is committing to, well, they, they took like 5,000 pre-orders in China in the first week. Um, so not pre-orders, um, commitments to order effectively. So they were like, uh, they were almost like a, a uh, crowdfunding sort of setup where everyone put down $500 and then they got access to a, a pre-order list and they get to be like founders and get to have early uh, contact center uh, information with what's going on to develop the car. Paul? Yes. Um, I, I noticed that the MG site for Thailand has got a sign up page, but when I looked on the UK one, it didn't seem to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did post on the forum about it because I think it's, uh, it's a little bit crazy because uh, my um, HS has got a sunroof and I had to get it specially coated to keep the tropical sun from coming in. And this is a soft top, and why they'd be selling it well, in it, Thailand. It's not con the concept car, the Cyberstar ah. concept was a, a roofless concept. Hmm. Um, I believe that they're looking at all options as to whether they, it becomes a coupe or a rag top or both, or whether there's one offered in one market and one offered in another. Uh, I suppose like BMW's M coupe and the Z3, that sort of idea. Um, whether it's two seater or two plus two. Um, but one thing I do know is that they're going to try and match those numbers that were originally said on the Cybersta um, sort of performance, which is zero to 60 in less than four seconds and a target price of less than £40,000, which would be, I think, pretty game changing in the, in the European market because there aren't really, well, there's apart from Tesla Roadster, which is not currently available, um, I can't, and the smart. For two convertible, I can't think of any other convertible um, electric cars, um, and certainly not that are available for less than hundred thousand pounds. So, I think that if they if they're able to hit that pricing, I think we could have an MG MGB GT sort of situation where you know you're an MGB convertible where you've got. Um, I think you should get the the owners clubs, the MG owners club interested as well. You know, all the people that have got the historic MGs that like the wind in your hair oil in your face uh, motoring that they um yeah you know, they would perhaps uh have the in the disposable income available to be able to buy one of these sort of cars to carry on their mg brand but you know to have a more usable day-to-day -day car but still with the sort of attributes which they associate with mg you know which is affordable sporty motoring classic mg driver though um i know a lot a lot, a lot of here say that they don't like the new brand. Well, no, because I think a lot of them <clears> see it as, uh, in, in some ways, MG, you know, when they did the hatchbacks in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, that was not approved of by the MGB GT and the MGC and the MGA community because they thought, you know, well, they're selling out because they're not, they're just doing, you know, 
max power body kit versions of um, of rovers rather than doing their own individual models. Of course, at that time it was MG was just fighting for survival in a way. But the MGF was one of the best selling convertibles ever. Yeah, I'd drive a, um, drive a couple of those, good car. Drive yeah, uh, the MGF, and, and I think if, if MG can get back to the MGF sort of level of sales, or certainly that sort of same sort of clientele, because as Guy was saying on the podcast before Christmas, rag tops don't sell well anywhere apart from really UK and America. Um, and America isn't going to start buying Chinese made convertibles anytime soon due to the uh, import issues there. So it really it's a fairly small market. UK buys more convertibles uh, than the rest of Europe combined. Um, I think that's due to our, it's obviously not due to the weather, it must just be due to our uh, affection for the idea that we might have a sunny day sometimes. So let's be optimistic and, and think we might be able to put down the roof for half an hour in March. We hold out for that one day, don't we? Yeah, totally, yeah. So I think that, you know, in terms of um, sort of what MG is hoping to, but I just want to say, I think that there might be for other markets, like for example, Thailand, a, a soft top isn't going to sell, but uh, a coupe might. So if they can sell it, you know, if they can make one car as a two-seater sport uh, drop top and the other one's a two plus two uh, coupe, but share a lot of the manufacture, you know, the sort of the, a lot of the features, a lot of the, you know, overall things. I think they could be onto a winner around the world, but that that's still going, you know, ongoing testing. I'm not sure we're going to, I think we might hopefully see something of that at uh, the next motor show in China uh, in April, but I think that potentially it might be, end up being next year before that, before we see anything sort of more concrete. But again, I've got space in my new showroom waiting for that. So. Yeah, and there's a lot of talk about new showroom. What, what's going on with Charlie? What's... Oh yeah, so uh, uh, someone said, uh, da, 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 Jeff said, how's the new Charlie dealership at Burnley going? When will it be open? So uh, Burnley themselves, when, when I start, there's a, what you see behind me is the Burnley showroom. So that's been going now for a year or so. It was open during lockdown. Um, we were previously selling MGs from Burnley, but it was uh, a sort of we had a new extension done so we could fit this in our show, create a new showroom. Um, the Chorley branch have got a massive new purpose built flagship building, which was fortune to build, but it looks fantastic. Um, and that's uh, it's got some new headquarters offices upstairs and it's downstairs. It's all very, very posh, all sort of polished concrete uh, service desk that's about a mile long and all that sort of stuff. And um, so that looks great. And that's got, uh, we just got the chargers hopefully going in for that in the next few weeks. We've had some issues with, again, power supplies and, you know, boring stuff like that. Um, but we're hopefully getting a rapid charge and a couple of 22 kilowatt charges installed just to future, future proofers there. Um, but yeah, no, if you want to come down to, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do some sort of like open weekend. It's it's not been the last couple of years, it's not been the time to try and organise events, has it really? But um, um, we're hoping that we'll be able to have some sort of open and open day events around our new MG franchise to sort of encourage customers to come down and have a look. Because a lot of customers have bought cars off me and, and off the group um, in the last two years during lockdown. They've, they've maybe never seen inside the dealership. They've just picked it up from a car park because of the way of COVID. But uh, Hopefully, that's going to solve itself fairly soon. Well, if the sausage rolls, count me in. <laughs> um, maybe follow on, Stephen. Let's see. Let's go posh. <laughs> what are they? <laughs> Somebody's asking um, about the ZS standard range uh, and setting it to 80%. I don't think you can do that, and I don't think you'd be able to reprogram it to do that, would you? Um, I'll be honest. I haven't tried driving a standard range ZS yet because... Um, we haven't had any, well, we had one come in um, and it went into the showroom. Um, so I haven't actually driven it. So I need to have a look. I'll check that. Um, I don't know if it gives the option of altering the charge level. Um, I'll have to, nasty, or n 2 sty I'll have to uh, ask that question. I'll have to find out myself and come back to you. I'm sorry, I don't know. Good question with asked. Mm -hmm. A bit early to know if we can have a spare wheel on the MG4, isn't it? Uh, I... <laughs> 
for the car that hasn't been announced yet? Yeah, probably is a bit too early. Um, Chris, I suspect you will be able to get a spare wheel because it's one of those things that we do offer as an accessory for the other models. Um, and it's probably going to be the same hub pitch and everything as the ZS, so I'd imagine it'd be the same one that fits. But um, pass. I don't. I don't want to claim you can and then not. Um, okay. Just here's a top tip: get less burrows onto. That'll get it sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Les will sort it out. Les will, um, Les will sort it out for you, Chris. Question from Jack, Jack Slade: Miles of any Trophy Connects? Surely sold had trouble with infotainment system. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, but there was a software update which was. Um, because effectively the car that Jack got was supposed to be a demonstrator um, because uh, all the dealers were sent, sent like two cars, one for the showroom, one to demonstrate. And Jack bought one of the demonstrators from his dealer. Um, and then we got a recall notice saying that all the demonstrators had to have a new version of software fitted for the um, infotainment system to cure some issues. And if he's not been back for that since he bought the car, I suspect he probably does need that still. So it's a couple of USBs, takes about half an hour. Uh, for them to do it for you, Jack. So if you speak to your dealer and ask them to fix that for you. Good. And then moving on to the last uh, topic of the, the night, and it's probably the most disappointing and, and harsh, is just the ever-increasing price of energy. And uh, I suppose the only mitigation of that is looking over uh, to the, the petrol forecourts and seeing some horrendous prices for petrol and diesel. Um, but yes, yeah, the energy prices, and I suspect what's going on in the Ukraine is not going to help in the long long term, short and long term uh, either. Um, yeah, no, it's, it, I've, I've managed to, I'm on Octopus Go at the moment, I'll go faster. Um, and my tariff's due to end in April. And I don't currently know what tariff I'm going to get offered in April because unfortunately that ties in with when all the caps go massive and everyone can suddenly start charging the earth. So, Paul, don't know if you've been following what's happening in the UK, but basically um, our fuel costs, well, I currently pay a peak rate of 13.3 pence per kilowatt hour for electric and an off peak of 5.5 pence. And that was a good tariff 12 months ago. Um, but now, the best tariff on the market is still octopus go faster, I think, but it's seven and a half pence off peak and 23 pence peak. So it's 10 pence per kilowatt hour higher on the peak. Um, but from April, they go, they're able to charge something like 30 pence per kilowatt hour, I think, or 28 pence per kilowatt hour um, peak. And I think that the off peak is going to go higher as well. So for me, I've looked at my sort of my usage. I, I live in a four bed detached house, two electric cars. Um, so our electric consumption is quite high. Um, my wife is from Poland, but uh, she likes warm heating inside the house. Um, so uh, the, the house is usually heated to sort of 20 as a minimum and 22 probably as a peak. Um, it's a relatively new house, five years old. So it's not, it's fairly efficient. You know, it's sort of a, it's in the A banding for, for efficiency um but our gas bill is going to go from 900 pounds a year to 1800 pounds a year and probably higher um and our electricity bill uh again has gone from it will go from about uh, 900 pounds a year to well at the moment it's forecast it could go if, if, if i was to lock on the current cheapest tariff which i can get um which is available today my usage would probably double uh, in cost if I uh, if it goes up again in April before I get to lock on the tariff, um, then I'm, it may well you know triple or or more. I think the worst case scenario it's looking at going from combined electric and gas going from say eighteen hundred pounds a year to around six thousand pounds a year. Um, so, um, Steve, I know we've spoken about this before. Yeah. You've got solar and a battery, and Paul, you've got yeah. a massive amount of solar and lots of batteries. Um, so that's where I'm sort of, that's where I'm, I'm thinking. So I'm getting some quotes in this week. I'm just if you can do it, I recommend it. I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't believe, I, I, I could never have predicted it, but I'm, I'm, it's now paying, in theory, it's paying itself off quicker now because of the rising price. Yeah, I think that when I did the sums, when I first moved into this house, 
um, it was going to be sort of like 12 year payback based on being able to get really cheap off peak electric and most of my I, two thirds of my usage is off peak. Um, so I, I use about um, what 4,500 kilowatt hours um, peak rate per year and about 9,000 off peak. Um, which is quite a lot, but it's um, all my electric car usage for both electric cars and things as well, you see. Um, what I'm thinking is if I get solar, I can get about six kilowatts of panels on my roof. Um, it's south facing, so that should be helpful. Um, if I get some batteries, I might be able to hopefully offset all of my peak rate usage in winter as well. Um, and then just charge up the batteries off uh, on the off-peak period in winter or have a bit of solar top in them as well. And then worst case scenario, I'm just going to be looking at the cheapest possible off-peak tariff. So, yeah. Paul, just uh, two questions that come out of that. A, are you noticing energy increase prices out in Thailand? And B, what exactly have you got? Uh, your your practically a, a nuclear power source yourself, aren't you? <laughs> um, well, just quickly on the electricity, it's uh, it's 10p uh, a kilowatt hour here. And I think they're talking at 15% increase sometime this year. But electricity is basically owned by the government. There's no private. Um, and so I think there's a certain degree of uh, stabilizing of the prices. Um, there is a off-peak time of use rate, which is 6p, and uh, if you go for that, you're then paying 13p at the peak rate. Um, with regard to solar, um, the key thing for me is the installation costs. Uh, as I start trying to explain to people about salaries out here, uh, if you were to take what the, uh, the minimum hourly wage is in the UK, that is the minimum, the minimum daily wage here in Thailand. So in-store costs are very, very cheap. So I have 20 kilowatts of, of PV. I've got four, nine kilowatt hours lithium uh, iron phosphate batteries. And my original uh, solar system had 30 kilowatts of uh, deep cycle gel, and I've still kept those. So that's my backup, so my backup sort of thing. But I did say this on the forum is that, you know, if you can use solar to, for your house and your car, then your return, return on investment, um, you know, is greatly shortened. So I don't pay electric bills on my house and I don't pay to fuel my car. My payback is five years. Even here in the UK, to, uh, yesterday, we had great sun. And I put 10 kilowatts in my car from solar. Uh, which I thought for February was, was absolutely amazing. That's it. I think that I think that having battery is probably the way forward because I mean I, I'm working from home a lot, but uh, there are times obviously I'll be out during the day and I'll, I'll you know at that peak that peak time of generation is when it would potentially be just be exported to the grid. So I think if I can put a battery on it now, plus in the UK there's an incentive because if you buy the battery with the panels, you pay five percent VAT. Whereas if you buy the battery, if you buy the panels, you get 5%. Then if you buy the battery afterwards, it's 20% VAT on the battery. So it can increase the battery by, say, £1,000 or so if you're, getting, you know, if you're getting it installed after the fact. So to go to put it together, if I'm going to do one, I've, I've kind of got to do both. Um, I just I think it's, I mean, it, I was having this conversation. I've been in Poland this last, I said my wife's Polish. I've just been in Poland this last week. Obviously, there's been a lot of news around the Baltic region, um, not about, about energy, well, some about energy supply, obviously, because of, you know, gas supplies from Russia and um, the reliance that the UK grid has on uh, on gas as, a, as an electricity supply, um, generally electricity generation, shall I say. And it's the same in, in Europe. There's a lot more Russian gas in Germany than there is in the UK. So I think UK is about 5% Russian gas. Germany is about 40% Russian gas for its um supplies so they have a, a, a harder problem if if you know if somebody decides to turn the tap off but um or blow up the pipeline but in terms of um sort of energy security i think that it's a way forward i think that like you're saying steve you know you're, you if you plan on a 10-year payback but it comes back in five 
happy days. But worst case scenario is 10 years. Um, I but originally you just worked that. it out to be about 12, uh, 12 years and I've sort of had a, a quick math up now and it's going to be around about eight, I think. So, yeah, yeah I think that um, I, I think there's so much uh, insecurity in energy supply generally in the UK. I, I think that um, there should have been before now a more concerted effort for us to switch away from reliance on other countries for fuel because um, yeah. we, we are incredibly you know when the link between France and UK caught on fire at, in December um, energy prices went up to you know 35 pounds um, per megawatt hour or so you know it was because it was um, we were so reliant on that for, you know we were so close to our limit for, for you know generation that we had to we had to buy in from all different means and pay for coal and all the rest of it and it's you know that's not where we want to be we ought to be on installing more solar more wind and i think that you know micro generation and batteries on your house is probably going to be the way that they ought to be encouraging people to go because it gives relief to to the local network as much as you know as much as that you know as uh it's lovely to, you know, it'd be great to have these massive, you know, Australian sized, you know, gigawatt array of batteries or whatever. But I think in terms of uh, a more sort of practical thing and what people can do themselves I'm, is what I'm looking for really for myself. I think that having the ability to generate at home and have more, more insight. I think, Paul, do you, do you find you have more, since you moved to this new eco house and you, you did all this with solar, you must have a, a much more, granular appreciation for how much energy you're using at any one time and how much you're generating and the appreciation yeah. for what's what's being used I, octopus have started doing this trail in the uk where they they've offered to the, the big power down they call it at times when the grid's particularly dirty and particularly expensive uh for us it was i think thursday between 4 30 and 6 p.m is that if, if that one and a half hours you can use le uh, 40 percent less energy than you would normally do we'll give you it for free um, because, uh, you know, we really don't want to be having to pay for, you know, 40 pounds per, mega, per megawatt hour or whatever for electricity. We'd much rather people just use less. And I think that if you give people smart meters and you give them a carrot and stick approach like that, where, you know, yes, if you need to use it, use it, but we'd rather you didn't. And if you can avoid using it, please do everything you can do to avoid that. And then, you get it for free or you get it reduced cost or whatever then that i think that helps everything because it helps smooth out those peaks and troughs on the grid um and you know hopefully then means that we burn less coal or less gas or i don't know less the dogs that they're saying that this the, the burns nowadays the carcasses of dogs or something was on the news the other day saying that they burn those to as, as part of uh biomass uh, some sort of Please, some, sort no, of puppy, there, some sort of puppy farm was was offloading dead dogs to a uh, yeah so that was a good one. Can for I me. just chip in? Um, uh, Please just to, <laughs> to answer you answer your yeah get off the dogs. Uh, uh, to, your your point about monitoring what you use absolutely. I get lots of information from the app on my inverters, but I've also installed and this is something people could do themselves. Um, effectively, like a clamp meter. Uh, so I have one uh, that goes to my car so I can see what's going into the car and I have another one for the house. And what I like to do is turn things on in the house and look at the app and say, oh, I'm going to make a coffee. And, oh, well, you know, how much of that? Oh, that's a kilowatt to make the coffee going out, you know. And so I've now I've got like chest freezers that are on timers that will switch off at night so that I don't use the batteries to run them and then they come back on again in the morning, you know, so that you do become much more conscious about what energy you're using. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say is a lot of people have put off solar because of this thing about uh, payback. When am I gonna get my money back? And if, if you're not getting a five-year payback, oh. And then I'm just, I would try to explain to people and say, well, look, if you have the money for a solar and you put it in the bank and you make half a percent, is that going to pay your electric bill or is that going to charge a car? No, it's not. So a 10 year payback is a 10% return. You know, people don't need to think about that. 
Mm. I think what I'm looking at the moment as well is with inflation in the UK hitting sort of six, seven percent, is that effectively if I install it now, it's the cheapest it's going to be. Because you know it that money is going to be depreciating otherwise. You know, so even if even if you can't afford to do it as a lump sum from savings, uh, which um, perfectly honest, I can't. Uh, if you take a loan and pay two, you know, pay like two point four percent interest, you can get on a loan still at the moment. Then, because it's seven percent uh, inflation, you, you've effectively you've got a negative interest rate on your on your loan. So it's uh, it's really um, yeah. I think it's it's probably the, it, I think it's a really good time to to look to inquire about it to see if you can do it. Now I know there's an awful lot of people out there who unfortunately. You know, live in a flat, can't get solar panels on their house. Uh, this is the other thing: prices at the at the rapid charges are going through the roof now, aren't they? Yeah, I see. That, is it fifty? Is it fifty pence or more at uh, Instavolt now uh, per kilowatt hour? So I think that um, yeah. Well, and, and this is yeah. This get we can go on forever. We're already over time, but I think that in terms of you know, talk about the injustice of the of the world and so that the people who you know, like me, live in a four bed detached and have two electric cars, can afford to either get a can either get, can either get a loan, you know, is either credit worthy enough to be able to get a loan to be able to buy solar panels to stick on your fancy house and run everything a lot cheaper, or that you can, you know, do it from cash reserves even. Um, whereas those people who are on the breadline who can't afford an electric car, can't afford um, to heat their house as it is, and they're going to be, dub, you know, doubled bills in the next 12 months and there's nothing they can do about it because they can't get solar they can't do anything you know anything else to offset it and their few you know their old scabby 20 year old car that's on its last legs is now costing them you know 100 pounds to fill the fuel tank um because of the uh, rise in petrol costs i think there is you know going to be a massive injustice and you know imbalance in between the haves and have nots and you know it's um that's not something I'm particularly keen on. I'm I'm a bit of a socialist at heart. And I think that that's um, that's something that that needs addressing somehow. Whether there's some extra grants that can happen, whether, for example, you know, council houses, don't, you know, can get solar panels installed by the council, uh, whether um, landlords can get grants to be able to put things like that on the property for their tenants, so that the tenants aren't the ones you know paying the highest honour. You know, on a coin-operated meter and paying the highest possible electric costs. There are, you know, it's it's um, it needs addressing. There are, I know, I do understand that as we started with this show, Dave. You know, we are incredibly. You know, these are very much third world problems. Uh, so first world problems. That's, you know, the people who are in Ukraine who are being bombed at the moment who are living in subways have obviously got you know a lot worse worries than me saying that my electric car is going to cost me a bit more to run this year. Exactly. Um, and um, I say, having been in Poland this last week, you know, seeing that, you know, it's literally next door. Mm. Um, so uh, I, uh, you know, my my thoughts are with them primarily, um, and uh, we hope for resolution there quickly. Um, but in the unfortunate situation where this does drag on, I do think that if you're interested in solar, this is probably not a bad time to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks for that. Um, well, time is dragging on, so I suppose we better bring this uh, to a bit of a conclusion. Um, before we go, there's a few things I'd like to draw to everybody's attention, which we do at every podcast. For those who are interested in Aura electric cars, the Aura Cat is coming to the UK soon. Uh, and we have the our sister forum, the AuraEV.com, uh, Aura EV s.com uh, so please have a look in there uh, uh, and, and pass comment and, and get involved if you'd like to support us please uh, consider uh, mgv's forum premier membership for just three pound a month it gives you the premier mem member badge the ability to uplift a profile banner the ability to select the mg red theme and of course a discount on mg ev merchandise 10% discount, which uh, you can, if you access the code. So finally, uh, please look at the, 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 the merchandise and then um, it's just a, a vote of thanks to those contributing tonight. Steve, always good to, to speak to you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. And sleep well, Paul.
Yeah, yeah, well, you'll be getting up soon. Paul, <laughs> thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And, and, and I, I do genuinely mean it. I love the way we get different insights. So thanks very much for your contribution tonight. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you for having me. Great. Oh, it's a, it was a delight. As ever, Miles, thank you very much. And thanks for all your updates. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone on YouTube for asking questions because it really helps us keep the conversation flowing as well. Yeah, and we've said it before, but if you could also suggest topics that you want covered, we would definitely be pleased to add that into the agenda for future. Uh, and I think we're probably coming up to a review of the apps that people use. I see quite a lot of talk about apps, so maybe have a look at that. And as ever, our appreciation goes to Stuart Wright, working as hard as ever in the background, making sure that all the things pop up on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll be back with another MGEV podcast soon. Please click all the likes and subscribes. We really do appreciate you doing that. So thanks. Good night. See you in the next podcast. Be well, be safe. <laughs>